Okay. All right. Welcome back. We were um, we just started with understanding a little bit about what counseling is. We looked at some basic tenets of uh, counseling. We're going to be looking at two two more portions now. Uh, just certain elements of a Christian counselor and uh, uh, certain principles in counseling that you need to keep in mind. Okay, uh, this is fairly simple. The elements, uh, or core elements of a Christian counselor, is fairly simple. But we'll just go through that. Uh, go through that slide little in detail. Okay, so the first one is that a Christian counselor needs to be spiritually mature. In uh, 1 Timothy 3, 6, it writes that the one who watches over souls uh, ought not to be a novice. That means ought not to be someone his, who is newly um, come in as a believer, but so not someone who's newly converted and instructed, but someone who is more seasoned. So the one who watches over souls should not be like an amateur. They should be spiritually mature, should have walked with the Lord for some time, really experienced um, and, and also helped others. Okay, So that maturity of, of life and of living um, is, is important. Okay, The second one should be grounded in scripture. The person who is a Christian counselor should be grounded in the scripture. As uh, John 17, 7, 17, 17 says, um, uh, teach them your word, which is truth. Sanctify them by your word, which is truth. So it, the, the person who is a Christian counselor should be involved in regular reading of scripture, in understanding, memorizing, living by scripture. Okay? Next is uh, they should be prayerful. Um, uh, they should be one who uh, continues to um, devote themselves in prayer, as Colossians 4 2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Just bringing all of the things that they may be dealing with in counseling situations in prayer. Uh, next one is they should be a giver of hope. Okay, Proverbs uh, 13, 12 reads, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. So those, them to be able to give hope, you can only give hope if you are filled with hope, right? Right. You cannot give somebody hope if you feel, huh? you, you don't, you can't give something you don't have, right? So, um, and we know the hope that does not disappoint us, but we know that God loves us and it is He's given us uh, the Holy Spirit and fills our hearts with love so that we in turn can help and support those, those uh, can support others. Okay, they should be someone who are activators of change. What does that mean? Uh, someone who is able to bring people into conversation, bring people into um, uh, into really exploring their way of life so that they can put on the new nature that is created by God. And you know you could go back and read uh, some of these scriptures where it where it talks about the scripture talks about um, the Holy Spirit renewing our thoughts and our attitudes, being able to put on that new creation that is created to be like God. So we we need to be that activator of change from them moving them from that place of sin to a place of um, active change. Okay. Uh, we should, uh, as as a counselor, we should be able to um, uh, make a practice of scripture at every area or or at every problem area that you may that you may encounter as part of your uh, um, you, you know your uh, uh, your counseling sessions. Uh, uh, James one twenty two reads, "Don't listen just to God's word. You must do what it says." Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. So as a believer, as a counselor yourself, you practice the scripture. You practice whatever it says, especially in the areas 
that you may that, that there are problems okay next is we need to be compassionate just as jesus was you see how jesus reached out to people being moved with compassion you know and um, he uh, he touched people uh, healed people out of the compassion that was there within him and the last one is the need to use wisdom um, to be to be able to um, be in the fear of the lord because that is foundational to wisdom so that we can operate from a place of wisdom even as we are counseling knowing what to say when what not to say when being able to lead people in the right form of questions in the right form of direction is using that wisdom okay now all of this comes um, as we build ourselves in the word as we build ourselves in the knowledge of the word okay all right. The next we are we are going to uh, look at its certain principles of counseling. These are very important because uh, um, these are like um, you know when you put up a tent, you put pegs on a tent. No, it's on those you put those stands on a tent when you put a tent because that's where the tent holds. Right. So similarly, every principle is something that is foundational to the certain profession. Right. So we will look at some of it uh, that is that's important uh, for us to know. Okay. Uh, the first one is uh, what we call as individualization. Okay. Uh, I know these sound like big words, but for each of these principles, I've put certain examples so that we know um, what we mean by this okay so let's look at um, uh, the example uh, it's a young couple has just had a newborn baby and they realize that the child is physically challenged the husband being physically challenged himself is quite calm and composed and acceptant of the reality whereas the wife is troubled and very distressed at the thought of a differentially able child okay so you understood it's a couple who has a baby. The husband also has a physical disability. So he's quite composed having a child like that. But the wife uh, is very, very troubled. OK? So um, what do generally people do when you are in a situation like this? What is the advice they would give the mother when she's so distressed? It's probably say something, look at your husband, he's so strong, you should be like your husband. Isn't it? <laughs> Nina was thinking of something big. <laughs> yeah. So that's exactly when you when you see see your your husband is so strong, you should also be as strong as that. Right? That's the immediate thing that we may think we should be saying. Okay, because that's what we are we are we are noticing but what does this principle say the principle is saying that no one person is alike every person is different in the way that they see the world the way that they feel the way that they react the way that they respond to anything okay even though the problem may be the same or the cause of the problem may be the same it's still the way that one takes it can be very, very different, all right? So as a principle in uh, counseling, you are, what are you doing? Individualization is letting them know you have a right to be you, OK? It is based on the right of people to be individuals. It's OK to be you. It's OK to be different. And that's why also, you know, um, even in counseling, you uh, you may you may have a lot of people who are very different from others who come in for counseling, right? Like, uh, for example, there may be a a, a a member of a family who comes and says, you know, I'm very different from all my siblings, all my brothers and my sisters. They are all a certain way. I'm very different, and my father and mother have always told me I should become like that. And if you as a counselor are also going to say, yeah, become like that, you're, you're no different, right? So what are you doing? It is helping people see that you have a right to be you. 
okay it is it's based on the right to be an individual and we treat them that way so what are you doing you are recognizing that each counselee has unique qualities they have unique experiences okay they are a different entity they're they're not attached to anything they are as unique and as um special right just like each of us are made in the image of god right all of us are different unique we have our dignity god's given each one of us a dignity and that's what we recognize so in counseling we recognize every person who comes to us is a brand new make right okay then um so so when we are dealing with people we may not like you know when you go to uh, service your car they have a 10 step process of servicing the car no but maybe like they have 10 things that you do to every car right so man is not machine so when someone comes to you for counseling you're not doing the same thing that you did for the person before right it may be a totally new conversation that you're that you're holding so that's what it says the use of principles and methods to assist client can be very different there are different use of principles or methods that you're helping people to make that change so you're not treating every person who comes to you like a machine it it can be a very very different conversation every time you have so that's what individualization basically means that they should be treated as someone who's unique who is a, a, a person or a, a or a entity that is that's very special okay that's not shouldn't be uh, compared to anybody else or anything else that you have probably seen so that is what the so the principle of individualization each person is treated as an important individual okay clear yeah okay it's also a right to be treated as a person with personal differences so each of us could have our personal differences and it's that right to be treated for who they are all right okay um are you all okay with the first principle can i move on Online students, very, very quiet today. No conversation. OK. Um, the second principle, uh, we'll, we'll look at two examples, OK? A young wife lost her husband to sudden death. She comes to you and cannot control her tears and her emotions and is incessantly crying. Or a man is sharing and says, I'm so depressed, I can't work, I can't think, I just sit there all day. Which principle is this? Ah, okay. I just sit there all day, nothing gets done. Okay. Now, when, when someone is talking to you or is in a conversation with you and they're very, very emotional, what is the first thing you may do? You may tend to, we may all respond differently but what do we do console them okay francis what will you do you don't know someone is crying in front of you what will you do huh? you'll say don't cry yeah huh? hmm. so very often we are very uncomfortable when people get emotional right that's true correct but i'm saying when someone is doing that in front of you i'm asking you your response how are you what would you do how comfortable are you Yeah, huh, I, I, I understand what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, what would you do? You said, let them cry. You'll sit and watch. Okay, you'll sit and watch. Hmm. 
Okay, so uh, especially maybe in our culture is that we are very uncomfortable when people show some emotion, isn't it? You think about maybe you know when you were growing up. When you started, when you started cry, what did your parents maybe say? <laughs> what beat you more? <laughs> yeah. So, so ba basically, we we are because we have not probably been allowed to express when someone else is expressing. We're also very very uncomfortable. We just want to somehow get out from there or say something, finish it fast, and abba over. All right. Um, but in counseling, there is an important principle which talks about to help them have an expression of feelings, which is called a purposeful expression of feelings. So in your time with them, it's just not getting them to cry, 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 you know, all they come 10 times, all 10 times they're crying. It's called purposeful. Which means they need to express, but it also needs to lead to something. Okay, so the first recognition of this principle is that the counselee needs to express feelings freely. You should give them enough opportunities, space, time for them to express their feeling. Okay, sometimes what we do is when they're crying. The first thing we do is we ask a question. You ask a question, like, like Susan, Susan was crying, no? Susan was crying. What did your husband do? It's a question. Right? So you are actually moving her into correct, right? But allowing them to stay there. And cry. Now that doesn't mean you keep quiet. That's a technique. That's you know you use certain techniques to help them to purposefully express those emotions. So that's called the purposeful expression of emotions. And when you do that, in order to do that, you need to listen carefully. You need to listen purposefully. The word is purposefully, being able to listen to what they're saying. Remember, it's not just the content, but it is the emotion behind it. Right. In fact, when you talk to many people, no one's going to say, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling angry. Nobody will say that. What will they say? My husband did this and he did this, and how could he do that? And you know, it's so mean of them. They will not tell you directly that they are that language they will not use. I'm feeling sad because my husband. No, they'll say my husband did this, or you know, that teacher, I wish I could kill him. All that why? Because they're angry, right? So the counselor needs to listen to what they are saying and deduct or infer what emotions they may be going through. Okay, so that's the principle of expression of feelings. Also, you're also the counselor is not discouraging or condemning any expression of feelings. You're not discouraging them to say, don't be angry, don't be sad, don't be jealous. No. You're not discouraging them, allowing them that expression. Okay. What you're doing as a counselor is you should be stimulating and encouraging them to express their feelings. Can you give me a way you can stimulate someone to cry or someone to share, uh, someone to feel? How do you do that? Uh, you should, uh, can you tell me? some way you can get a person to express their feeling. How do you? OK, let me let me give you an example, OK? I'm going to say, let's say I say, I had a very bad fight today. I'm only telling you that much. How can you encourage me to express more? I'm saying I had a very bad fight today. How can you encourage me to express my feelings more? Like, 
so what happened will only give you i will say i fought with such and such person we fought about this we fought about that i have told you the content i have told you the the matter the the circumstance i haven't told you my feelings right okay so okay how yeah so that's one way you can as you know how are you feeling about it right now uh, or you can say my that sounds as if that was really bad you know I, are you feeling angry about it or how are you feeling right now right so that's how you stimulate an expression of feelings when you say what happened or tell me who you fought with it's all the circumstance but an expression of feeling goes a little bit more deeper it's the next level that it goes deeper got that yeah okay all right uh online students are you all okay uh, oh sorry jackin said something hold their hand and console them by being there Sorry, Jack, and I think I lost. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, Jack. Okay. Good. So let's move to the third principle. I'll give you an example again. You have been called to see a man in the hospital. Before you go in to see him, you find out through talking to the doctor that the man is terminally ill. You go into the room, and the man says to you, I want to ask you something. Am I going to die? Do you know? Can you tell me? Am I going to die? No, there's no question. <laughs> Nothing. I'm just I'm just showing you. I'm just showing you an example. Someone is telling you, then he's asking you. I want to ask you something. Am I going to die? Can you tell me if I'm going to die? What? How would you deal with a situation like this? He's telling you his sad story, so much so that even you feel like crying. And then he's asking you this, am I going to die? Do you know? Can you tell me? Do you want Okay, so there, there can be sometimes when someone is someone's asking you a question, you really don't have anything to say, isn't it? Like, especially in situations like someone passed away. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Like if their mentally is so strong, uh -huh. can like um Okay, so basically this, uh, the, the principle that we are looking at is how can you be involved, your emotional involvement, how is how can you control it, okay? So as, uh, as a counsellor, you're going to be faced with very many situations like this. Right, that it is so difficult to even respond, right? and that's what comes to this question, uh, this uh, principle of being having a controlled emotional involvement, a controlled emotional involvement. Now you may look as if you're very insensitive or you don't care, but in order to help someone, you have to be. I'm not saying detached but you really need to know how much you need to be involved. So it's a sweet spot. You need to be sensitive to the, the counselee's feelings and at the same time learn how to stay in control or to be able to help them through that, that emotion. 
to bring them to a place of understanding. Okay, so that's what's called this controlled emotional involvement. Because if you're also going to be as emotionally affected by the counselee, your help is not um, effective. Okay, so uh, that doesn't mean we may not feel like that. I I remember, you know, my initial my initial times of counselling. I used to come back home and cry very often because it's a new thing. It's I haven't been in such a state before, listening to so many problems and you know getting so involved in their lives and things like that. But then in time, I also learned how to be have that sense of a you are involved where you're sensitive and you're compassionate and you're empathetic, but you're also you also know that there is a certain boundary that you may need to place as you are dealing with them, okay? So it is a purposeful, appropriate use of your emotions to respond to the counselee's feelings, right? Now, I'm going back to that example. So when he asks you, and am I going to die, what, are, what is something we can say if we are going to make appropriate use of your emotions? What is something you can say? Sorry? Hmm. So what will you say? But but if they, uh, there is no chance for him to uh, recover, he gonna die for sure. Yeah, for sure. And he is asking the question. We know that he will die, but mm. we have to answer. Mm. If we if we answer something, if we speak something also, if if we ask some more. See the the point is. Ask yourself: Is it something you really need to answer? You don't have to answer whether you know, he's going to die, yes or no, you will die. That's not it, right? That's that's not the outcome of it. So you could say something like, you know, I can't imagine the pain you're going through right now. Right? That you really would like to know an outcome of this. But unfortunately, even I don't know. But I'm here to help you through this. I haven't answered him. Because I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if he's going to. And maybe that's not the right time to tell him about God is the healer also. Because he's he's so, he's actually crying, right? And he wants some support and comfort and someone to just be there with him, that, that he's not alone. Right? And then maybe after that you can come and say, you know, let's pray together for strength. And, hmm. What is that? So in some of those times, it's a good thing to just be quiet. Right? Just be quiet and say, I know this is really, really hard. You won't die? Okay, so so see, uh, I'm talking about initial responses. Okay, now all of this will come at a later point right? when you've calmed them down, and then you can. This is that he said, "Am I going to die? Will I die now? No, is this happening?" She's just he's he's. Um, Okay, remember you are counseling here. Then the outro. <laughs> oh, there are counselors who who uh, are in places for death and dying. Right? Death and dying. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so many there are. Especially people who are terminally, like those who die of cancer or some kind of thing. There are counselors there who help them through that last stage of life.
Oh, yes. <laughs> what will happen? Is that the answer he wants to? I don't think he wants to hear an answer. It is out of that yeah, angst and expression of sadness he's talking about this. He's not like a doctor telling you, am I going to die? It's not that. It's, it's a news that maybe he's got. The doctor has told him about everything. And then he is sitting with that news and can't be, and is in a place of shock. What next? Or how is it going to happen? Exactly. So that's, that's all of those emotions are happening over there. So our role as a counselor is not to give them an answer and say, ah, yes or no. That's not it. It is how are we helping them through that stage? And one of the principles is how can we stay involved yet controlled in our emotional response? Right? Without actually giving them an answer. It's like I said, counseling is not about giving them answers, it's about leading them through difficult stages of life where they find a way to cope through this. Okay? All right. Um, also, when we're looking at emotional involvement, control emotional involvement, it is how much a counselor is going to be involved in the problem of the counselee, objectively being involved in the problem of the counselee. Like um, maybe your counselee once leaves your room, they're going to get into a problem. Okay, and you're saying, okay, I will also come with you. Right? So your involvement in the problem also needs to be controlled and uh, objective. Okay? You're not solving the problem for them. Like, let's suppose a husband and a wife, someone or the wife comes to you and says, my husband is beating me. Okay? You're not the one should go and give a, uh, whatever, a complaint to the police station. All right, or you go to the husband's house and say, why are you beating her? That's not your, that's not your job, right? But what you do, you're empowering her to, to be able to take action. You can, you can support and assist, but you don't, you, you have to be involved as objectively as possible, okay? And control emotion, sorry, sorry, sorry. And uh, controlled emotional involvement in the counselee as a person. Even, even uh, how sometimes you may have a soft corner for people because of the kind of things they're going through. Your, your involvement with them also needs to be very objective and controlled as well. Okay? Oh, there is? Okay. Uh, so an emotional person does not qualify to be a good counsellor. No. Uh, nothing like that, uh, Jackin. Nothing like that. Uh, is it so, or is it possible that we can learn and develop these skills and help some people at least? Yes, absolutely. Right? We are all emotional at some some core. Uh, it is. It's a skill. It's learning how to stay involved, to stay objective, yet know how to be have that sense of boundary or a sense of control as you are uh, dealing with them. So it's a skill that you learn. You're right. It's something that you will learn as you practice it. OK? All right. The next one. We'll go to the next principle. It's the fourth principle. So what is the first one? Individualization. Second is purposeful expression of feelings. Third is controlled emotional involvement. OK. Next one. The example is a young woman comes to talk to you about God and his existence. She feels that she can't break away her allegiance to her God, but yet would also like to treat Jesus as one of the many gods. <laughs> they also come. Yeah, you have many mixes like that. Yeah. So in a case like this, when, and this is why we talk about the principle of self determination, where you're giving the individual the right to make their own choices. 
and make their own decisions on something. Right? You're giving them the right. You cannot override somebody's decision or somebody's choice on anything. You can bring them to a point of awareness or understanding and looking at what are the benefits or what are the disadvantages. But at the end of it, it is their own choice. It is an individual's own choice of how, uh, how they decide and do things. So the counselee has a right and a need to have freedom in making their own decisions or choices. They have a right and they have a need. Although there are certain limitations to it. What are some of those limitations? Is limitations of uh, not harming somebody else right or maybe harm to themselves for example if the counselor the counselee comes to you and say i'm going to commit suicide you can't stop me you know i will i will go die you can't say ah, her right her need let her go do what she wants you have a responsibility because it 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 concerns the life of another person all right okay so Otherwise, with, within those limitations, they have the freedom to make their decision and their choices. All right? The counselor has a duty to respect the right in theory and in practice, and you refrain from any kind of a direct interference. Right? You can't manipulate them to do something you want them to do. Like, uh, for example, if you don't, you know, if you... If you don't go back to your husband today, I will call your mother-in-law and say. You, know, you cannot have any kind of... Or if you don't go back to your mother-in-law, you're going to go out on the street. That's emotionally blackmailing them, right? So no indirect or direct form of interference is, is possible, right? So that is the principle of self-determination. The ability for the counselee to make their own choice or decision in any given problem or a situation. Next one. A husband is talking to you and says, you know, I have all this guilt. Every time I sleep with this other woman, I feel so guilty. What can I do about it? Okay, so there are going to be times you are going to have people with different kinds of moral codes that come to you. And that's where we look at the principle of acceptance. That is recognizing that every person has dignity, has worth, has equality, has their needs. So that does not mean when you're accepting someone, you're accepting their behavior. That you're saying, OK, what you're doing is right. When I accept you, that doesn't mean I'm accepting what you do. Okay? So your acceptance of people is regardless of their behavior, their environment, their characteristic trait, their personality. It's regardless of that. You can you accept them for who they are. Okay? You had a explain. So when someone comes to you with a problem that uh, like like the example I spoke about, you know, this husband was sleeping with other women, right? It was infidelity. And it's quick that we may judge the person for what they're doing. But in counseling, the principle in counseling is we accept them as people for who he is, for uh, knowing that they have dignity, they're unique, they have worth, we accept them as people regardless of their problem or their environment, we accept them as people. So which means we do not dis judge, dismiss them because of their behavior or because of their sin or because of their issues that they're coming. They are accepted for who they are. So it's like God, as a, human. as a human, correct, correct, exactly. You, you're not approving of it. That's what it says. Acceptance does not mean approval. Approval is saying, okay, great, you're doing good. 
you're not approving, you're accepting them as people with a behavior, with a condition, with a situation. <clears throat> okay, but it doesn't mean you are approving of their behavior or their attitudes. Acceptance also will include uh, how they think and how they feel. All right. And uh, even how you think and how you feel towards them and what kind of service you give them. Right. Like, for example, we tend to treat people who are nice, nice. We tend to treat people who are right. But in counseling, your way of treating people, even if should be, is the same. It is based primarily on who they are. And however you serve them, that's what it says, is expressed primarily in the manner of service. So the way that you're thinking about them, you're feeling about them, should be from a mind of respect and honor and acceptance. OK? <clears throat> Biblical, no? <laughs> Think of how Jesus saw the adulterous woman. Right? Acceptance. But he didn't approve of her behavior, but accepted her. Right? So that's what we're called to do. OK, next one. Prince. Hmm. I'll share this with you. I'll share the PPT with you. OK, next is an um, uh, example. A wife in counseling says, I just separated from my husband. I'm emotionally involved with another man. I'm not sure that my husband and I can work it out. I know what my beliefs are, but I'm not sure what to do. The principle of non-judgmental attitude. So in a situation like what we spoke, what I gave you, uh, often, you know, people going in for some help or support will say, hey, you know, what is what you're doing is wrong. You know, you're in, you're in sin. You know, there's a lot of judgment that happens. Okay, So this is very closely related to the previous uh, principle where there's a non-judgmental attitude, where it is based on the premise that the the that when you are seeing them you're not assigning any guilt or innocence which means let's suppose the husband and wife is sitting here you're not there as a judge pleading someone guilty and pleading somebody innocent you're saying okay wife you are guilty you're very innocent that's not your role okay not being in a place of judgment which means being non-judgmental Okay, no matter what the situation, it's not just acceptance of the person, but also not judging them for what their situation or, or they are in. Okay, uh, it includes a principle of non judgmental attitude, also will include how you make your statements of, um, you know, towards your counseling your attitude towards your counsel, how you treat them or how you act towards them what are what are some judgments that you use to say things about them to feel about them so all of this is not just in your behavior but also in the way that you think about them okay it it is not making those evaluative judgments about their attitudes or, or who they are or what they are so that you you see them as sorry you see them uh, just like the way God sees them, right? So not having, not being in a place of judgment. Okay, next one. Uh, the example is a teenager comes in to see you, sits down and says, I hate my parents, they stink, and I don't care what happens to them. Okay. Here is the principle of confidentiality. What is confidentiality? Yeah, It is not disclosing any secret private information 
in the relationship. So like this, when you are meeting maybe members in the family, one family member may say something about the other, other family member, or they may say some secret thing of their own life, right? And it is not uh, in, uh, as you as a counselor cannot be sharing that information to others. Okay, that's what the principle of confidentiality is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so confidentiality is a right of the counselee who comes to you, right? And actually it is a ethical obligation that is in the professional profession of counseling one of the biggest ethics a counselor needs to hold on is confidentiality and and if you breach that confidentiality you you have breached ethical principles or ethical practices okay it is necessary for helping why because if your counselee knows that you may go and share this with somebody else yet they're not going to be open enough to share or discuss with you. Uh, the right, however, the confidential right is not absolute, which means um, uh, uh, there are two, two conditions, that information about the person can be shared among other professionals, like counsellor to counsellor, so that they can get the best help that they want. Like, for example, if the counsellor is stuck on what to do, um, there is a written um, permission that is given that it will be discussed with other colleagues for better help. Or confidentiality is also not absolute when there is a risk to somebody's life. Okay? Or there is a risk to someone else's life. And someone else is trying to murder somebody or, um, you know, abusing someone. Or they intend to take their own life that time. Uh, that's when confidentiality can be divulged, can be breached. But it should be all with a written permission that is required to divulge information to others who are involved. OK? So just going back to those seven, yeah, OK? So these are the seven principles, individualization, purposeful expression of feelings, controlled emotional involvement, self-determination, acceptance, non-judgmental attitude, and confidentiality. Yeah. So, uh, I just want to know this uh, legal things. So if a person is going through a situation which they want to take their life, so he, uh, the person came to a counselor and he counseled, the counselor counseled that person, particular person, uh, whatever happened, we don't know, but that person took their life. Mm. So what will be the legal things will uh, this counselor will face because of that? So the responsibility of a counselor, if someone does come in like that, is to, with with uh, in that session, to be, uh, after assessing the risk, to be able to inform someone next of kin, generally. Uh, that's something that we do, right? Like if there is someone over here and we assess a suicidal, a high suicidal risk, we do uh, inform, get the person in confidence and inform a, a third party or a whoever, so that they get either vigilance or they get adequate medical help. So, to the family. So generally in a counseling sheet, there is the name of one person that they have to write down, an emergency contact number, right? And it will be written there, in case of an emergency, this person will be contacted. And that's what they sign. If, if it is a position like, say, uh, you, you are a pastor, someone messaged you on WhatsApp or some social media, and they wanted to take their life, be before that, they wanted to speak with you. Hmm. So after speaking with you, they took their life. Mm. So when when interrogation so, happened, because so I heard a situation. situation. Like so so what ha what is important, Anand, is when you get calls like this, there is a certain protocol you have to follow, right? Like 
if it is, I mean, I know sometimes there are these um, uh, helplines, suicidal helplines, where you can't track. You can't track the person. And it's an anonymous call. And that time you can't track it because that's what it is meant for. But if it is at least people you know or, you know, something you know, it's important to lead them to uh, some form of help. So without that, you shouldn't cut the call. You shouldn't hang up on them till you've ensured some help, either in the form of them seeking out somebody or you know you offering to call that someone and make that conversation. That's very, very important, especially if you assess high risk. And that is a way to assess high risk. So I know sometimes you know lay pastors are not equipped to deal with those situations. But then if something like that happens, there is some way to deal with it so that you know, legally also you are protected as well as the person has. Um, uh, not you don't have to inform the police only. You can inform a family member so that they say this person is like this. Please come in right away and take them or, you know, please ensure that you go there, get back in touch with them, get them for help. That is something you must make sure you do. All right, any questions or any thoughts? <clears throat> Interesting? Okay, all right. If there aren't any questions, we'll close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for helping us learn something new. God, we understand and know that the ministry of counseling is vital um, in church as well as for the outside world. I pray that um, even as we go through this, that you will equip us, Lord. You will give us greater understanding. Lord, you will help us, Lord, learn um, uh, not just skills and techniques, but also from your word of how important it is, Lord, for connection and building relationships with people and helping them see the truth of your, your word. Thank you for your grace over each one of us. Till we meet next time, we pray that you will work in us and you will uh, continue to um, examine our hearts, Lord, so that we could be uh, right in your eyes. Thank you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Meet you next week. Thank you, students.